So my name is Daphne Lei. Uh, I'm the director of Illuminations Chancellor's Arts and Culture Initiative. So we are so glad today, and I'm so happy and so honored today to have Joshua Cohen with us, uh, the newest. Um, the 2022 Pulitzer uh, Prize winner for fiction. Uh, so we had actually started planning the, this, uh, this event you know, quite a few months ago. And so I'm so glad that he has the time to fly across the country to be here with us today. Um, before we start, I'm gonna thank a few sponsors. Uh, so first of all, I wanna thank Mark Fisher, Professor Mark Fisher. He's the one who suggested uh, Joshua Cohen to, to be uh, on our program, so thank you. And also, thank you for helping out throughout the process. Uh, I wanna thank um, Professor uh, 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 Jeff Kopstein and then the Director for Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, and then uh, Michelle, okay, you're here. <laughs> and then Michelle uh, uh, Latiole and, and, and her uh, creative writing uh, students as well. Uh, she drew her students and we had, a, we had a lunch, very nice talk today. And then some of them are here today because I know all the writers would love to be here to be inspired. Uh, and then uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Judy Wu for helping us out. And then also, uh, I guess Jonathan's not here, Jonathan Alexander, uh, for also helping us to uh, publicize the, the event. Yeah. So a very quick introduction because we really want to focus on him today. So, um, so as we know that he's the uh, 2022 Pulitzer Prize winner for fiction. Uh, and then his other novels, including Moving Kings, it's 2017, Book of Numbers, 2015, Wits, 2010, A Heaven of Others, 2008, and Cadenza for Schneidemann Violin Concerto, 2007, and The Netanyahu's, which is the focus today. And that one was uh, 2021. Uh, so, and also he has a short fiction collection, Four New Messages, uh, which is 2020, 2012, and then a nonfiction collection called Attention, Dispatches from the Land of Distraction, <laughs> that's 2018. Um, he's got numerous awards other than the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he's 2013, he received the Israel's Mantenel Prize for Jewish writers. And 2017, he was named as one of the, uh, one, one of Greta's best young American novelists. And this book, The Netanyahu's, won the National Jewish Book Award for Fiction in 2021 and 2022 Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so for today, we're gonna focus uh, in, the, in the first hours. Uh, it's gonna be kind of a conversation with the reading. So we'll start with the reading and conversation uh, with Joshua and you know, um, Mark and I. Uh, and then uh, around seven, no, around an hour, an hour from now, and we're gonna have uh, Q&A. We're we'll gonna open up for Q&A. And then the last half an hour, we're gonna have the book signing. So I know some of you probably brought your own copies already, but we also have books for purchase. All right, so yeah, without further ado, let's welcome Joshua Cohen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll start with your first reading. Right? Okay. Yeah, cool. this is the beginning of the book. Yeah. Cool. First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for thank you all for coming. I hope there it doesn't look like there's enough cookies. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, raise my voice. There are not enough cookies. <laughs> it doesn't seem so. Um, okay, I'll just I should read from the beginning of this thing. All right, I'll read from the beginning of this thing. Um, I don't know that you need to know anything about it besides it's sort of uh, said in 1959, 1960 but not really, because I don't know anything about those years. Um, and uh, and the, the guy is a historian, um, except maybe he's not, because I don't know anything about being a historian. And um, 
and uh, he, he's specifically, well, you'll find out what kind of historian he is uh, in a little bit. My name is Ruben Blum, and I'm N, yes, N, historian. Soon enough, though, I guess I'll be historical, by which I mean I'll die and become history myself in a rare type of transformation traditionally reserved for the purer scholars. Lawyers die and don't become the law. Doctors die and don't turn into medicine. But biology and chemistry professors pass away and decompose into biology and chemistry. They mineralize into geology. They disperse into their science just as surely as mathematicians become statistics. The same process holds true for us historians. In my experience, we're the only ones in the humanities for whom this holds true, the only ones who become what we study. We age, we yellow, we go wrinkled and brittle along with our materials until our lives subside into the past to become the very substance of time. Or maybe that's just the Jew in me talking. Goyim believe in the word becoming flesh, but Jews believe in the flesh becoming word, a more natural, rational incarnation. But by way of further introduction, I will now quote a remark made to me by the who shall remain nameless then president of the American Historical Association when I met him at a symposium back in my student days just after the Second World War. Ah, he said, limply pressing my hand. Blum, did you say? A Jewish historian? Though the man surely intended this remark to wound me, it merely succeeded in bringing delight. And even now I find I can smile at the description. I appreciate its accidental imprecision in the way the double entendre can function as a type of psychological test. A Jewish historian, when you hear that, what do you think? What image springs to mind? The point is, the epithet as applied is both correct and incorrect. I am a Jewish historian, but I am not an historian of the Jews, or I've never been one professionally. Instead, I'm an American historian, or I was. After half a century in the professorate, I was recently retired from my post as the Andrew William Mellon Memorial Professor of American Economic History at Corbin University in Corbindale, New York, in the occasionally rural, occasionally wild heart of Chautauqua County, just inland from Lake Erie, among the apple orchards and apiaries and dairies, or as dismissive, geographically illiterate New York City folk insist on calling it upstate. I myself was once one of these city folk, and though that old wisdom is false, that teachers learn more from their students than vice versa, I did manage to pick this up early on, never call Corbindale upstate. Though my initial focus was on the economics of the pre-American British colonial period, my reputation, such as it is, was made in the field of what's now referred to as taxation studies. And especially for my research into the history of tax policies influence on politics and political revolutions. To be sure, I never much enjoyed the field, but it was open to me. Rather, the field didn't exist until I discovered it, and like a bumbling Columbus, I only discovered it because it was there. By the time I got into academia, America was already crowded, even American economic history was already crowded, and I've always had a decent head for numbers. Taking on the history of taxes got me out of the ghetto of colonial catalactics, and eventually even out of America itself into the European city-states, feudal tax farming, church tithes, antiquities development of customs duties and trade tariffs, all the way back to the Rosetta Stone and even the Bible, both of which, most people forget, are substantially just tax documents. <laughs> what else is salient? I wish I knew, but do we ever know? I used to open certain of my classes by paraphrasing Twain, who himself was paraphrasing Franklin, who for his part was presumably plagiarizing Brighton's Untold. Nothing can be said to be certain in this world except death and taxes and the due dates of your papers. <laughs> Let me begin. Thank you. So can you just talk a little bit about the, the background of, of this book, uh, the story with Harold Bloom and mm. Yeah, just the inspiration of this book, yeah. Well, yeah, Harold Bloom um, was an English professor, uh, a, a kind of an expert in romantic poetry, a Shakes an idiosyncratic Shakespearean, Shakespearean in many senses, uh, a very large man and a very larger than life kind of personality. Um, and uh, so about 50 or, or 60 years older than I, I am. Uh, uh, he was, he, he died a few years ago. And um, he wanted to write a memoir. Um, he'd, wrote, he'd written a, a memoir sort of about his life in poetry. Um, but I think he wanted to write a memoir of like where the bodies are buried, kind of, you know. <laughs> and um, people can hear me back there? Yeah, okay, good. Because um, this is really important. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> 
And he didn't want anyone from the university, he taught at Yale, didn't want anyone kind of working with him on it uh, I, for many reasons. Um, and um, he had written a, a little bit about a book of mine called Book of Numbers. And, you know, I suspect he said such nice things about that book because he wanted me to work for him. Um, you know, and so he, he called me up one day and he sort of summered, summoned me to New Haven and, you know, said nice things about me. And I'm very cheap. So I said, sure, man, what do you want? And, um, and he at that point couldn't type. I mean, his mind was intact. His mind was, you know, he had um, in a, an eidetic memory, you know, so he could recite whole pages of, of, of not just poetry, of prose that he just sort of looked at once. It was, it was kind of, um, it, it was terrifying actually to, to watch, especially when he's reciting back to you your own work, which is just like, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but he couldn't uh, type. And um, he was in a wheelchair at that point. And so we began kind of working on, you know, we'd dictate sort of some, some memories. And there were some, you know, very funny things, some of which I kind of stole for the last part of the book. But um, he was from the generation of, I, I, I don't know why I associate this, I associate this with my grandparents, but it's maybe the first generation that had television um, in that he just always had the TV on it was just always on, on mute, as if like you couldn't turn it off, you know? <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you press the button once and then you forget the button is there. And, um, and so CNN was on and, you know, this was, this was at a time when it was just like, you know, Trump, 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 Trump. And, uh, and then Bibi Netanyahu comes on and Harold goes, oh, you know, I, I met that guy once. And I'm thinking, okay, did you, you know, you, maybe you met him in the 90s when he was UN ambassador. Like, I, I don't know, where were you, you know? And he said, no, he was, I think he was nine years old. And he was like, okay. And he said, yeah, I think he was like nine or something. And yeah, I met his father and um, I kind of took him around. And I said, you know, okay, tell me about it. And he, it wasn't a story that sort of he was the hero of, so he wasn't interested in it. And, uh, uh, but also I think that he just didn't, you know, remember all the detail. I mean, that's the thing, you know, he had an amazing memory, but for the things he wanted to remember. And then, um, and then uh, uh, essentially what happened, oh, and then Jean, his wife, who's still around, she comes into the room and, you know, they've been married for a million years, right? And she immediately goes like, no, Harold, that's not how it happened. This is how it happened. Like, you forget everything, you know? And, but it's all this kind of sketchy mixed memories of something that happened, you know, at that point, you know, 50, 60 years before. And, um, and, uh, uh, and then Harold died. And uh, pretty soon after that, and I had to kind of, I wanted to put something together for, for a memorial service for him. And I was listening to all of these recordings and that, that little anecdote just stuck out with me. And I just decided that this was a good story, you know? But then I, I immediately realized that I couldn't write Harold because no one would believe it. He just, you know, it would just, it's like you don't need two freaks, let's say in this, in this book. So I wanted to write sort of the anti-Harold you know, just someone very boring and, you know, just I do tax policy and the history of tax policy, you know. So, um, and, and so in a way it was based on Harold, but it was based on the opposite of Harold. Mm -hmm. uh, should we have the second, the, the, the second reading? Okay. First? Yeah, then, sure. Yeah, then we can. Okay. Um, God, what do you have to know for this one? I've jumped around like this. This is this is just um, so he's from the Bronx, um, the Grand Concourse, uh, um, and um, and he doesn't he moved to the narrative and then moves to you know Corbindale, Corbin University, which doesn't exist, and um, which is in Western New York, not upstate Western New York, <laughs> and which you know could, should be Ohio, basically it's that far over, and. Um, and so he's just sort of remembering um, these, these things uh, uh, from the Bronx, but really because he's been asked to take around this candidate for a job in, in, in medieval European history. And he's a, again, an American economic historian. So he's like, why am I taking around this medievalist? Medieval in many senses. Why am I taking this guy around? And, and you know, there was this sort of assumption on the, the point of the faculty that, that, oh, he's one of yours. He's also 
you know, this Israeli guy, he's also a Jew, you, can, you should take him around. And so um, that makes him think about this church uh, in the Bronx. Uh, in the Bronx, not far from the manicured jungles of Pelham Park, there is a mid-block boxy edifice of scruffy whitewashed brick from whose portico juts a marquee of burned out bulbs and jagged lettering that sometimes proclaims, thank you, Lord God, and sometimes offers a cryptic reference like Acts 1-7 or Ecclesiastes 1-9, but always states its name to reassure the skeptical, the Church of the Assumption. Though I'd already left the borough before this marquee appeared, at some point over the years my visits back, the novelty of it got lodged in my mind. I used to park my car in front of it, thinking who would steal a car from outside of a church? And the church's strange appellation gradually became a kind of private joke or personal pun for whenever anyone presumed upon my Jewishness or presumed to prevail upon me by appealing to my Jewishness. Whenever some Hasidim from the Corbin Hillel would accost me with requests to don a yarmulke and donate money to their cause, or whenever some young student of poli sci would corner me with a request to affix my name to a petition in favor of peace in the Middle East, I'd always think, aha, another member of the Church of the Assumption. Dr. Morse was a member of that church in good standing, but then so too are all of us, Goyim and Jews alike, members in good standing and even with good intentions. In my childhood, this scrofulated one-armed man used to stand outside the Tremont Avenue L, stop jingling begged pennies in a paper cup in his single hand. Years and years later, I ran into him again on a Manhattan bus, and he was carrying shopping bags from Macy's, carrying them in two arms, with two hands. Who isn't a member of the Church of the Assumption? My father used to tell this story about working on some garment district line with some benign, deficient pole who wanted to propose to his girlfriend and so bought a diamond ring. He brought it into work one day to show it to the Jews he worked with and ask their opinion, as if cutters of cloth were synonymous with cutters of precious stones, as if Jews and Jewish expertise everywhere were interchangeable. With utter sincerity, he wanted all of his Jewish co-workers to examine the diamond and give their assessments. Because you people are the experts in these things. Tell me, uncle, did I get taken? I bought it off one of you people, but not one of you I know, not one of you I trust. You'd tell me if I got taken, wouldn't you? And of course, all the Jews on the line dropped their shears and examined it. They held it up to the light, they polished on their aprons and cooed over it like it was a clear-eyed newborn and told him it was magnificent and at the price he paid for it a deal while the pole just beamed, worshiping at the altar of the Church of the Assumption. And then there was that story about my mother's brother, Uncle Sruli, an ersatz grocer who'd spent most of the latter 1940s and early 50s borrowing money from my parents, and from who knows how many other families from around the Grand Concourse to open up a store whose business and location kept changing every time you asked. A produce stand on Webster, a shoe shop on Park, a flower shop down in Spanish Harlem, until eventually Sruli stopped answering questions and vanished, and even then my mother still believed in him, she still trusted him, he'll make good, he'll turn up even after the Kali gang came looking for him, even after the Manzanetto boys came, and even after Struli's almost unrecognizable corpse was found nearby a construction site for the Caciosco Bridge on the banks of Newtown Creek. He'll make good, he'll turn up. Same church, different assumptions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the idea of uh, assumption, presumption, or, you know, can say stereotype, microaggression, and all that kind of things. And very often, well, not ill intended, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, and then that's the assumption. And I think that's, you know, that, that's what Blum is experiencing in, um, in, um, in the university, right? Like during the Christmas time, he has to play uh, the Santa Claus. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he has a beard. <laughs> But also the assumption that he will not enjoy Christmas. Yeah. I mean, he could enjoy Christmas. He doesn't celebrate it. But well, then, who doesn't enjoy Christmas? Right, right. because yeah. the assumption is that he seems, yeah. you know, he's Jew. He doesn't celebrate Christmas, so why not let other people enjoy it? Right. Yeah, I mean, for me, I wanted to just, you know, I I was interested in that generation, right? I I didn't have. My, my, my grandparents were immigrants, um, so not as settled in a certain way as this character is, but they were of the same generation. And, um, and I just thought, you know, there was a lot of sort of New Deal Democrat assimilationism mm -hmm. that was in the air for um, ethnic whites at the time. And I think it did bleed over to um, certainly parts of the black population in cities. 
too, of this idea of um, the, the safer and smarter thing was to acculturate, was to assimilate, to identify what the power centers were and what the power centers expected of you and to just be the best at it, to be better at it than the arbiters of power, right? And I was interested in that approach to things versus the contemporary approach to things, which is the insistence on difference and the insistence that some power center recognizes difference. And um, they, are, they were two fundamentally different ways of dealing with feeling outside. They were two fundamentally different ways of feeling empowered, mm -hmm. right? Or, or defining empowerment for yourself. And, um, and neither of them seemed to work out. And so I'm interested in um, these two generationally opposed approaches because, um, first of all, because I think that it, it, it gave me the drama that I needed for the book, but also because they seem to me to be so um, fundamentally um, opposed in, its in, in their respective conceptions of what America is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I felt that that wasn't really a thing that was um, written about. I felt like that, that I'd grown up reading a lot of books that were um, written by that generation of the, um, of the assimilationist, of the how to act and be. And, and wanting to act and be in a certain way that 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 breeds success, um, and then the generation, my own generation, wrote a lot of books from the other approach, right? Which is the 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 you know declaring identity specific specificity and that recognition from power centers, and um, and so having grown up reading books of that generation, being surrounded by books written by my own generation from that other approach, I felt that there wasn't one book where those two concepts lived together and were kind of forced into proximity. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I wanted to do that. Because that means more people read you. <laughs> it means old people read your books. Yeah, I, I think assimilation is still a, a big topic, right? For, immig for immigrate, uh, sure. immig immigrants and you know, assimilate, assimilate. And then it's definitely a generational differences, right? The, the second generation can say I'm different because their parents have build up, you yeah. know, through assimilation, right? So they have the luxury to, to be different. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could comment on how you created the uh, Ben Zion Netanyahu character and how much of it was based on the historical record, uh -huh. how much was your imagination, and also some of, some of the ideas that uh, uh, are described in detail in the book in terms of the uh, Netanyahu's view of the, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, the establishment of the State of Israel, some idiosyncratic ideas. How much of that is huh? historically accurate? How much of that represents your... It's 100% true. No, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I would know. I, I felt the only thing that I really felt responsibility to, um, to, to a factual record was representing his views and scholarship. I mean, it, it helps that I wanted to... That's why I wanted to use him, because of certain things that he had written and believed. Um, but, um, and, and also I feel like, you know, my, my one moral qualm maybe is, is like, I, I, don't, I don't feel like uh, I could ever write and attribute a quote to a historical character in a novel and actually that not being a quote that they wrote. So all the quotes of, 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 of any of his writing, you know, is, 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 is him. Um, Benzino Netanyahu, you know, I'm sure everyone knows who he is because he's super popular. Um, <laughs> um, Benzino Netanyahu is a weird, weird guy. Um, and he's sort of proof that, like, that, that, that power, you know, I, as if you needed proof of this, that, like, that, you know, someone with repellent ideas um, in power is, is a monster and someone with repellent ideas without power is really pitiful and in some way, you know, evokes a degree of sympathy. He was a person who uh, essentially found himself um, unable to work in, um, in, in Palestine, in pre-state Palestine, um, for a number of reasons. He would say, um, if he was here, which would be terrifying too, um, he would say that um, because he was a, um, a 
so-called revisionist Zionists aligned with, 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 with loosely aligned with a number of Jabotinsky movements before he became a secretary to Vladimir Jabotinsky. Um, a right wing, I mean, right wing is a contemporary word for it, but you know, a, 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 a hard right um, um, Jewish supremacist um, and, uh, and they wouldn't give him a job, right? These, these sort of like Mapai labor Zionists, um, who they, they, they didn't want him involved with things. Um, the, the other kind of explanation was that, you know, his father, um, Nathan Milikovsky, like they moved from Poland. The father just kind of drops the family off in Palestine and just says like, see you later. And, and actually, funnily enough, goes to the States. These people just love coming to the States, you know? Um, and, um, and so he kind of grows up, uh, compared to a lot of people, he's, you know, he, 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 he's, he's a mix, sort of like he spent enough time growing up there, and, but he still has some Warsaw in him. But he, he gets a degree in history, he goes for a degree in history at, at Hebrew University um, and in Jerusalem at a time when um, it is being flooded with refugee scholars from Europe, especially in its history departments. So, you know, there's the idea of, are you, you know, would you hire like the local guy to do the thing? Or are you going to get, you know, like the cream of the faculty from like Friedrich Wilhelm University or from, you know, or from the Sorbonne? And, you know, and you can get all of them pretty cheap, right? So, uh, uh, so it's probably a combination of those two things. But because he can't um, get a job and because he then um, participates in a botched um, um, bombing of uh, his own university, which helps. You shouldn't bomb your own university if you want a job there. Um, it's really, though, his brother in the mathematics department who, who, who manufactures the device. But um, uh, he has to kind of go to America to make his fortune. Uh, uh, I mean, fortune's a nice word for it. But to get a job. And he kind of is on the adjunct circuit and gets kind of passed around and, until he ends up at Cornell University, where he teaches until 1976. And, but his whole life after, when he comes to the States is just sort of one of resentment because during the most consequential, this is from his point of view, during the most consequential decade of, of, of I would say, all of Jewish history since probably the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans. Uh, so that's a pretty large stretch of time. Um, during the most consequential decade in, in, in Jewish history, he's not being murdered in Europe, nor is he building um, a new country, um, he's like living in suburban Long Island and suburban Philadelphia, um, sort of burning with rage and resentment. And, uh, and which turned him into an interesting character, right? It turned, you know, it's, it's, he has a very kind of put me in coach mentality. It's one of those people who, you know, like I don't know if any people are related to any, you know, usually males in your family who like watch TV and then they say like, well, if I was president, I would do this, you know? I mean, this was, his entire life was watching things like that and seething. And, and he kind of raises his children in a hothouse of that resentment. There, there are also a lot of, you know, very sad and, 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 and uh, horribly tangled family setbacks that he suffers. And, and um, anyway, his specialty becomes, I know this is a really long answer, especially becomes the 15th century, becomes the Iberian Inquisitions. And he, um, and it's not necessarily that is the theses that he develops around the Inquisitions are so crazy. It's that, um, it's that he is really an activist historian that is using um, the past really um, um, to talk about the present. And, um, and he sort of, at a certain point, abandoned any pretense of, of, of being a strict historian in a you know, in, in an American now international academic sense, and 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 very much became a um, almost a a medieval historian, right? Um, n not just being a history of the medieval era, but a medieval historian in the sense of he consciously adopted a medievalist view of history, which is to say, you know, um, opposed to a meliorist or progressive view of history in which every generation sort of tries to atone for the sins of the generation before and where the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice and the world gets progressively better. And he had this medievalist view of time, um, not as this line, but as a circle that, um, that the same sort of uh, patterns of events recur in every culture and every society. And that, and that one was doomed to live within these cycles unless there was a, a, a shattering of history through, through, um, through a people's will 
And so in a way, you know, that, um, you know, I don't think that's a kind of history that we teach a lot these days, but, you know, he would claim that there was a, um, that there was actually a longer tradition in that form of history than in a contemporary idea of what a historian does. So, well, academia, and, you know, by reading this book, I, I just imagine that you're actually teaching the university. In the know. 60s? Yeah, yeah, in the yeah, 60s, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I know you teach at uh, Cornell. I'm not not Cornell, uh, Columbia, Columbia yeah. and, and Yale uh, a little bit. Which is uh, adjuncting. It's not. I don't have to go to these meetings. <laughs> but the academia you portray. I mean, other than the cocktail in the department chair's office, or mm. bringing your wife to a job interview, and mm. other things are pretty accurate. Oh. <laughs> And then certainly the, the the kind of you know the, the assumption um, and, and then the stereotype the microaggression is, is um, well, I was saying you know like, like one, one of the one of the great things of you know not being in academia mm -hmm. right is I have a lot of friends who are in academia and they can't kind of complain to each other about things for political reasons so I'm just the repository of all their complaints. You know like I'm the person that they'll like ask to get a drink with and then just say like I'm gonna kill this person you know like and so I just I feel like I should be getting health insurance like through them or something like I feel like I should be getting their benefits yeah so I've soaked it up ambiently it, okay yeah, yeah, yeah because my yeah. question is like, how yeah. did you do your research <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean just being a friend you know um, no I, I, I felt like um, the the I think the campus novel is a thing that's pretty well defined I think you know movies, you know, like, like at this point, it's, you know, it was, it, it you know, the, the dog wags the tail, the tail wags the dog. I mean, at this point, I think a campus is like a parody of a depiction of campus in film, which itself was a parody of a real campus. And it just, I just think that the wheel renews itself, you know. Um, but I think for, for, for me in, in this, um, in, in, in this environment, I think one of the, you know, one of the reasons that people like writing campus novels is that um, increasingly in a world that seems bewilderingly large, it's a very defined way to also bring a lot of diverse people together, right? It's, it's like it's a, it's, a, it's a demarcated place with power structures and hierarchies full of people who, uh, you know, wouldn't be around each other otherwise. Right, and we're all kind of crazy too. Right? Kind of, right, you know, like right, you can, right. can have and, all these crazy remarks, you know, and, yeah, theories, right. and, yeah. and 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 so it's this microcosm of, of a world, and also the um, what is it? It it's also that the all of the conventions of the novel, which have been really broken in a lot of ways by technology, right? Where it's you know characters are always kind of like. You know, a big part of a novel is like keeping two characters away from each other for a long period of time, you know, to create tension. But like every with any time anyone has a phone, it just destroys that, <laughs> you know. But at campus, you can do something of like, oh, funny, just bumping into you. You know, all of these sort of Victorian conventions um, you can still do on these Victorian campuses. Um, you know, people have like they can check their mail, you know, their mailbox. You know, they can like pass each other in the hall and. Um, and it's it's very difficult to do that in sort of any other surrounding. Now, after publication of the book, I, I understand that you've had some contact, direct or indirect, with Bibi Netanyahu himself. And wondering if you could talk about that. Well, I didn't make contact. I mean, it was a lawsuit. I don't know. That's, <laughs> I don't know. That's contact. You know. Uh, um, yeah, it was just it was a crazy. You know. Um, he had a bunch of lawsuits. He still has a bunch of lawsuits against him. And, um, and so I guess the strategy is when you have a bunch of lawsuits against you, you file lawsuits against a bunch of other people. And um, what's interesting, and I didn't realize this, I mean, I should have realized this, but I didn't, is that, um, well, I, anyway, so, so uh, Ehud Olmer, the former prime minister, another former prime minister, called uh, Bibi, um, I guess, was mentally insane. And he called his wife mentally insane too, um, and um, and Israel as a former British colony, um, they follow their law follows British defamation laws, which are very different from American defamation laws, and um, and you know not to impugn 
British defamation laws, but I think they're fucking crazy. You know, um, one of the things that you have to do as a defense in a defamation lawsuit, you know, is essentially prove that because essentially someone who's suing, you sue someone for defamation, you have to say that that person has materially deprived you of being able to earn a living or harmed your reputation in a material way. And the way you defend yourself against that lawsuit is you say, well, the shit I said about you is not the worst thing that someone said about you, <laughs> which is crazy, you know? And so of the various exhibits that were brought in, um, Omer brought in this book and they read um, portions of it into the court record and, um, and uh, yeah, and it was, it was fun, I guess. It was ridiculous, it was a try, you know, it was, but, um, and yeah, he, I have to say of all the crazy shit that guy has said, um, you know, I thought his answer was sort of touching when they said, you know, do you read the thing? And he's like, yeah, I flipped through it, you know. It's like, yeah. And he said, I stopped reading when my mother appeared because my mother spoke perfect English. And I think he just objected to me making his mother not, and his mother did not speak perfect English, so it doesn't matter. But, uh, but I like that every son thinks their mother speaks perfect English. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of beautiful. Um, and so, um, but yeah, I, I think that, that in, in a lot of ways it was, um, I mean, it was a total distraction. I mean, the whole, entire trial was a complete and total distraction. But, um, but it's fun. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it's more interesting than just sitting at home, you know. So, so, so this book was uh, translated into Hebrew too, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, uh, so how's the, how's the reception over there? And then also, I guess, think about, do, do you guess, do you, do, you, do you receive a different kind of response? Uh, like now and compared to last year? Like in the last six weeks or something? Yeah. I don't know, I, you know. Uh, or, or. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, I mean, God, it's like, it's just that whole, you know, and this is something that I think, you know, people with, you know, family in, in, in the region, like, like one thing, you know, I think a lot of people understand is like, that place is so small to take up so much news. You know, and I'd say it's just and like, so the idea is what's the reception? That's like asking like, did they like your book at Whole Foods? It's like, it's so tiny. Like how many people are, are gonna, you know, it's like, and then a lot of people are gonna read it in English. So, I mean, how do they, it's a, it's a book. They probably do, thanks for publishing a book. And you know, uh, a bestseller there is selling like 4,000 copies. So um, I think, you know, it, 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 again, I mean, that trial was really the, the, the reception, I think. Um, and, uh, and that helped sell some copies, I guess. Um, I, has a response changed? I mean, I don't know. All these, it, it's also just like, um, I, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that the people who are negatively disposed to Bibi Netanyahu just became of that opinion in the last six weeks. I mean, I think that, like, you know, that, that guy has a long track record of, um, of doing things to, to, to piss you off that I don't think that, like, a, um, uh, a book, let alone a sustained aerial bombing campaign, is going to change anyone's mind about anything. Um, I think that, that, you know, it's, it's a 15-year track record of, 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 you know, that speaks for itself. Um, I, uh, I think that my own feelings over the last couple weeks of this is, is odd. It's been odd because it's, you know, people want a political opinion from a guy who wrote a novel, um, which is just like, if you want a political opinion from a guy who wrote a novel, then you're fucked. <laughs> it's just like the wrong, it's like, it's like, it's like going to the hot dog stand for a hamburger, man. Like, it's just, you're not going to get it, you know? And, uh, uh, and I think, Secondarily, it's this idea also that, um, I think it's the idea also that, that everything can, um, I don't know, I'm, gonna, like, I'm glad that we're on video, so I'm just gonna say something totally obnoxious, it's great. Uh, so it's not just for everyone here, it's totally, it's gonna be obnoxious forever. I just, I think that one of the feelings that I've had um, among many, many feelings, some of them you know, personal, some familial, some of this and that, um, 
one of the, the writerly feelings I've had is actually just, um, you know, this resentment that everything gets folded into the a political context, mm -hmm. right? And I, I just, I, I kind of came up reading writers and loving writers who were the unacknowledged legislators of the world, right? And it was just, it was that, um, it was that they were, it's not that they were uh, above politics, it's just that politics was one mode of rhetoric within like a, um, within an emotional psychological spectrum, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, um, that raised a level of discourse, you know, beyond screaming. And the idea that, you know, because you published a book, you then are invited to participate in the Scream Festival is, um, is crazy to me, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like um, that part of the, you know, that I understand the temptation for a writer to participate in that, but, um, but it seems to me that, that every slogan is, is anti-literary. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I, I, you know, I, and so it, 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 so one emotion I've had is just kind of dismayed for writers who have been made as dumb as everyone else, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, but I think the, the temptation, as you're you saying, is uh, because the politics is mixed with like reviews and critique and, and all that kind of things. And you seem to have a very healthy attitude dealing with, with that. I drink a lot. I don't eat healthy. <laughs> but I just, well, I, think, I think what I mean is, is that, is that what, when, when people ask a writer for an opinion, right, you know, um, a writer is forced to use most of the time feels forced to use language um, that is deeply degraded, mm -hmm. right? You have to speak in the terms that are politically given to you in order to be rendered comprehensible and, um, or at least pertinent to the subject. And, and that already feels so controlling to me, you know? It's like, please speak to us politically on this subject, but, you know, the caveat being, you know, the vocabulary derives from us. Mm -hmm. And, and that to me is, it's, 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 it like, that's the entire reason I became a writer, which is that I didn't want to take words from anyone. I didn't want to take ideas from anyone. I didn't want to, I wanted to be completely alone. Mm -hmm. The idea that like, I would be in a group of people chanting anything, the idea that I would be in an army, the, the, the idea that I would associate myself with absolutely anyone else and let them determine language for me felt to me and still feels to me like death. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, um, there, there got to be a point where I, I was able to, I was able to dismiss that feeling for a long time, but I think recently in the past, you know, month or so, I've become to truly resent it because I, I, because the model that at least I possibly invented for myself previously, like that there was a way around this sort of discourse previously, um, it seems that all hope of that is, 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 is lost. And it feels very, very lonely if one of your ideals in life is to, you know, is to animate the world through your own language. One of the many memorable characters in the book is Idi Netanyahu, the youngest of the three brothers. Yeah. And at the end of the book, you, you talk a little bit about how he turned out as a radiologist in, in New York, I think, and how, yeah. you, how you attempted to reach out to him. Mm -hmm. Had, had any, anything ever come of that after the publication of the book? No, I don't think that guy wants to hang out with me. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think that, that uh, uh, what came out after the book that I thought was funny was that a lot of people were like, Oh, I, I, you know, I knew the father. I knew that, like, I, I have some stories to tell you. And, you know, after a while, I was just like, okay, the book's done. I don't want to hear. Like, you know, because the worst thing is if you hear something really good and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, you know, and, like, that's exactly <laughs> what I needed. Um, so you're kind of just like, okay, cool. You know, you saved that. Um, no, I think that, that, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, You know, th there's a, a really interesting uh, uh, um, line that I, I think about a lot in a section in a novelist that I talked to some students about today, the Victor Serge line, where he, he essentially says, you know, you know, we have more in common with everyone alive today. We all have you know, more in common with everyone alive today 
than we do with um, ourselves in the past or our ancestors. And you know, it's a very basic idea, right? But I think just to hear it phrased in this way of, you know, we have more in common with each other than we do with ourselves at an earlier date or with our ancestors is, you know, I think it's, it's, it's also just true for the Netanyahu's of my fake 1960. You know, the idea that a, a, you know, a kid in the book who's nine years old is going to, who I, again, basically made up, you know, is going to have anything in common with someone now or as if, you know, and, um, and I don't know, you know, I was, I was on a very aggressive, um, I was on a very aggressive Israeli uh, 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 radio uh, show, and this guy starts yelling at me, which is always fun. This guy starts yelling at me, um, how would you feel, you know, if, if B.B. wrote a novel about your father? <laughs> and I, I stopped for a second, and I was like, that's amazing. Like, <laughs> I would love that. I mean, I, my father would love that. I would love that. Like, <laughs> I'd buy all the, co you know, and I just, it was just that moment. And I think it, I mean, it deflated him in a way, but uh, so yeah, I, and, and so I, I think, you know, uh, and I say that knowing that like, what would be most interesting for me is not that I would think that Bibi Nadia would capture Barry Cohen perfectly, <laughs> but I would just be really interested in thinking what, who he imagines him to be. That's it, it'd just be interesting. Does he ha actually have the skill to write a novel? I, I, you know, you don't need that much skill to write a novel. So. <laughs> well, I mean, we talk about language a little bit. Well, this is a book that's very dense. I have to look up words, not just Hebrew words, but English words as well, <laughs> right? Uh, so, but then the, 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 this bilingual approach, what, 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 was, uh, what was the design, right? So do you want people to look up every word? Do you want people to look up a few words and then give up? <laughs> or do you just want people to, okay, skip the whole section? Or just going for the, like a, the, you know, the true reader who can read both languages very well? I mean, what, what was your calculation? <laughs> I don't know that I do have a calculation. I don't know. I feel like, um, hmm. I, I, I think I was always one of those kids who always wanted to hang out with like the older kids, right? And, um, and I just, I always just wanted to be cool, mm. right? And um, you can see how far that got me, but I just always wanted to be cool. <laughs> and, um, and I would always like read things that I didn't understand and I would like pretend to understand them or convince myself that I did just because it was cool to understand them. And there was always this idea of like an aspirational idea of, of, of you know, wanting to know what the in-group talks about. You know, I, I, I also, you know, I had some jobs growing up where, you know, kind of anyone who's like worked in a, in a restaurant, like in a kitchen, you know, you know what the difference is between the front of the house and the back of the house. Like, you know, you know, that's why you stop eating at certain restaurants or you stop ordering certain <laughs> things. You know, but you know how things are talked about, right? And it's that shop talk, it's that internal talk um, that you, I, I've always wanted to know what people were really, really saying and really, really thinking. And I wanted to become accepted by them and to be able to speak with them, both in literature and socially. And so I don't understand, truthfully, the culture of, oh, I don't get this. I'm not going to look it up or, or, you know, or like this to me is it, 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 um, I don't understand this idea of like, you know, an uh, inability to comprehend being frustrating. I, I always saw it as this, you know, as this almost dare of, you know, can you hang with this? Mm. Well, because, because I, I know you're, you also, you know, um, you know, you, music, right? Uh, music is uh, your background is in music as well. Mm -hmm. It's the rhythm, right? The reading of, of the rhythm, it disrupts the rhythm if yeah. you don't know the words, yeah. right? And so maybe sometimes it's uh, to keep up with the rhythm and then you just, okay, I'll just skip this word. I'll just oh, <laughs> skip yeah, yeah, this yeah. section. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think a lot about the rhythm of things and the, the color of certain, yeah, 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 yeah. And the periodicity of sentences and sure. I also think that there's a huge difference between you know writing by hand and writing on the computer and um, you know, where, where it looks like a book already. And, and computer writing tends to be really, 
like eye and handwriting, meaning like it's just it's really connected to the way things look and the way things you know you're typing it and you look at it, as opposed to you know by hand it's really like mouth and ear writing, it's really just you know because it doesn't look like a book it it kind of flows from things there's this way your hand moves that's also I, it's, it's hard for me to explain but it, it feels very much related to the breath, you know and and the sort of in and out hand thing, and um, and I I. I, and I just I I always know that I'm ruining things when I'm I'm going by my eye and not by my ear. Mm -hmm. uh, what about that dictation, that kind of writing with a voice activated writing? Oh, so Google can still mom my ideas? <laughs> no, man, all the voice stuff they put on the cloud. They, like, you know, I'm not gonna do that. No, 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 no. I mean, I I yeah, I I can't do that. Like, what am I gonna like lay on a couch and just speak? No, I can't. No, 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 no. I need to feel like I'm doing something. It's like the only time I exercise. Like, you know. In your articles, I've seen a lot of references to psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, did you rely on psychoanalysis in any way to develop your novel? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've I, you know, I'm fascinated by it because it's just one of those things you just can't figure out if it's bullshit or not. It's just, I can't, you know, it's just, you know, and spend a lot of money to find out if it's bullshit or not. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing kind of way to write and to way to, a way to think about literature. I think that's always been more um, interesting to me um, in that sense. I think in, in this book, it, it, it has a lot to do with, um, so that's kind of one of the secrets of this book which is that, um, I don't know if that's it. it's not that interesting, but um, you know, Harold Bloom was most, it's a weird thing to be kind of most famous for your best idea. Most people are like most famous for their worst idea, um, but he was most famous for his best idea, which was the way he took a concept, you know, that was called belatedness, right? And turned it into this book, uh, The Anxiety of Influence. And, you know, in the really kind of, you know, added Wikipedia version, it's just this idea that from belatedness, this idea that, you know, every generation feels that it's born too late for authentic meaning or creation, that you look back, you see all the things that have been done by the generations before you, and it's terrifying, right? Just the achievement. And you, know, what can I add to this? How can I respond to this? So on and so forth. And, and Harold's approach was this psychoanalytic, deeply Freudian, like deeply, um, you know, Oedipal, patriarchal in a way, where he essentially said that, you know, there are two responses, right, which, which you know, we called strong and weak. Um, and, you know, essentially the weak response is, is, you know, you become an acolyte of the past and you, you kind of find a, a tribe or a writer and you apprentice yourself to them and you create things in their style, in their tradition, in their, in their mode, right? And, and, and maybe you do this unconsciously, right? You, you just become that. And then there's the strong writer, which is even weirder, which is the idea that, um, which I would say it's actually delusional, right? Which is you, you begin to think that something in the past is flawed. And not only that something in the past is flawed, because I think most people can agree on that, but that something in the past is flawed and only you can write that wrong. Only you have maybe seen the flaw and only your writing can sort of correct the flaw. So what you're then doing is you're responding to the past and correcting it and or, 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 or scolding it or in some way subjecting it to your view and bending it toward your view. And, um, and so I, uh, uh, I wanted to write a book that was about that theory of influence, which is, you know, that's why the book is kind of really 59, 60. I'm using a lot of the literary tropes in that era. Um, that's also why, by the way, the, the guy, one of the reasons I made the guy a, a professor of tax studies, right? The idea of what do you owe, right? And, and, and you know, a, a tax is, you're saying that your, your essential duty as a citizen is to kind of, you know, pay in to the, your people who surround you, who all use the same roads as you use and, you know, and use the same infrastructure. And those are your people. And how many people would actually define their people as the people who use the same infrastructure that they do? And, you know, and... Um, so this idea of, 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 of the tax on, 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 on you and, and what you owe the past and, um, and so on. So 
you know, I, I, I don't know that I have any thoughts about Harold's theory, you know, besides just my, my, you know, bullshit idea that if I dramatize the theory, I won't have to suffer from it. <laughs> um, but w what I do think is interesting is the idea that, um, you know, is, is the idea that, that what Harold was kind of seeing in literature seems to me also to adhere in politics and, um, you know, and certainly his definition of a, of a quote unquote strong writer is something that is very much also the definition of a strong man in politics. And, um, and that was an, a connection that I wanted to, to also kind of bring out. Yeah, you talk about hearing in, when you write and then uh, I'm also interested in music. Mm -hmm. Right, because I, I know you have a background in mm -hmm. music. And do you hear music? Do you think about music when you write? Uh, I, I was a, I was a, like a little kid, yeah. uh -huh. and, and and I played. They forced me to play when I was a little kid, and uh, and uh, and that was also just a, like a cheap way to go to college and mm -hmm. get out quickly, mm -hmm. you know, because they did that. Um, and then I just had like a nervous breakdown when I was like eighteen, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, uh, I think about um, you know, I think that in many ways. Uh, um, one of the one of the ways in which most writing is done right now uh, and is thought about, maybe is always thought about, is um, is is actually no, it's not true. There's recently there's been a a, a deeper fetish, fetishization of the sentence, right? That like the sentence as the unit of composition, right? And um, and I always you know, whenever I hear people kind of fetishize the sentence, which I think people talk about because it's easier to talk about sentences than paragraphs or, you know, pages <laughs> or, just, or chapters or whatever, right? Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, you know, big letter, period at the end. It's very simple. It's there. Um, uh, I think about um, all of the um, attempts, especially Baroque musicians, right, to write um, counterpoint, meaning, you know, more than one voice happening for single line instruments. Like, you know, thinking like, you know, Bach partitas for violin or cello or something like that, where you have to kind of make a single string or, you know, four strings, but you're playing kind of, you know, most in terms of a moving melody, one note at a time. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is, is mimic the idea of multiple voices going on simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether in a canon or a fugue, you know, and, um, and that's much closer to my concept of a sentence is sort of, I always, you know, want to. I never think that like a line is a line. I think it always has, it's always trying to keep a bunch of different lines mm -hmm. in the air. What about the, the whole, uh, like, a, you know, thinking about a piece, right? A composition, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the, the end of this book, it's that's just the chaos, right? Like everything's mm -hmm. going very fast. Yeah. And then I'm just like seeing like a piano concerto in the end, and I, like you can't really see the hands, the hands are moving so fast, <laughs> and, then, and then bam, and then it ends. Mm -hmm. Right, so it kind of reminds me of oh. that kind of composition. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot. You know, I, I think a lot of the form of this book is all screwed up. You know, um, and a lot of it just came from being very, um, uh, being very impatient with the way most books along these lines are usually structured. You know, um, most books. I mean, movies, you know, got it from books, right? And I always hate it when there's, a, like, the worst thing, I'll never watch a movie when right at the beginning it says, the following is based on true story. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just done. Like, I just, I'm not going to watch it. Like, I'll just, I'll go on, online and I'll read the true story. And then <laughs> it'll take me 10 minutes and it'll be fine. You know, but, like, I, I just, I hate it. I hate it. I think it's just, it's, I don't know. I mean, I can, we can speculate forever about why those things are there. But, um. I think with this book, a large part of the formal structure of this book is I just told myself I want to do the exact opposite. I want to just, what if we just made the movie and it's just a movie and then at the end it's like based on real events, you know, and just how that would work. Um, because I think that the, putting that thing at the beginning, which is saying this is based on real events, I think people then watch for the correspondences between, you know, how something, you know, shapes up to something, how it measures up to this, whether it responds to this or not. And, um, and then I think, but I think doing it at the end is in a way, it gives you the chance to point out the differences and then use the moments that you've diverged from things or developed from things as, as 
sort of energy for another movement, maybe. And um, so, yeah, I just decided to do it backwards. So maybe maybe one my, one last quick question. Uh, do you have any? Because I we, I know we have a lot of young writers here. Do you have any uh, advice for them? Oh God! Or don't take they, advice from anyone. Or if they get thing. or if they get stuck right, as as a writer, when you have a writer's block, and where yeah. do you find inspiration? I don't know. I mean, I just I think it's just I actually think that. Um, I mean, God, is this like a terrifying thing to say to an audience where there's like a lot of like literature professors and people in the audience? And, you know, I just I think I think that they make a really big deal out of this literature thing. I, I just I do, you know, and it's nice that they do. It's nice that they do because because it, it's a nice thing. And people like that. It's nice that people can get together and talk about books in this world. Right. Um, I think that the writing of it is is. Um, is very dumb. I think there's like an almost cow-like dumbness that is required to write these things. Uh, um, it's like just the ability to stand there with dead eyes every day and just put absolutely dumb stuff in front of you and not kill yourself. And seriously, and just you just do it every day. And if every day you put something in front of you and you don't kill yourself, like the chance is like you'll have some pages. And, um, and, 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 beyond, and beyond that, and beyond that, it's, it's like, beyond that, it, it's that the principles of it are very, very, um, they're basic, which means that the variations that can be made with them are endless. And, um, and um, but, but besides that patience or, you know, that Zitzfleisch, right, to just do it every day, um, there is also, I think, the, um, the ability to, um, the ability to see things that happen to you or that happen in the world, um, in a way that is deeply personal, um, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, I think a lot of people kind of see things and they write about, you know, um, how do we put it? They, there's a lot of like representative texts out there, right? That that are books that are supposed to kind of either speak about a individual's experience or a group experience, right? And I think people get really tied up in these knots of, um, especially in, in, in my generation and younger, of, you know, uh, of having very, very, um, I would say, frankly, like, like the low ambitions of I just want to express myself and the very, very high ambitions of I want to express something that represents my cohort or represents an identity group or, you know, whatever. And I would just kind of tell people that, that, you know, that those two aspirations, which seem to be kind of twin poles of literature these days, um, that there's really a, a large middle ground between those extremities, that w which is really where literature lies. And, um, and so I think part of that is also taking every thought that is very, very personal and sort of extrapolating it out into the world and taking everything that seems very foreign to you and trying to make it very, very personal. Um, and um, and and I I, I I I think that you know between those two things um, you know there there's a lot of literature to still be made. Thank you. Thank you for that advice. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks so much. I, I read this book this last summer. I loved it. And I'm, I, one of the things that I loved so much about it was um, its focus on the, I mean, I think the core of the book, mm -hmm. I mean, and I'd like to hear, the core for me, the core of the book was that it was about the, the campus interview, which is a kind of, and a campus interview gone awry. Yeah. A, a job interview, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a job interview, it's a job talk, it's a visit, and yeah, anybody yeah. who's ever been in a department, I am, yeah. right? One of the things that you always face is that you have these candidates who come in and you've got to entertain them and wine them and dine them and bring them in and then they come and give this talk. Sure. And he's the job candidate from hell. Yeah. He's the worst. Yeah, yeah. He's impossible. Yeah, yeah. And of course we know, because you know yeah. and we all know, he gets the job. He does. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so how did you ar ar arrive at this, right? Because I mean, 
this is a, not how did you arrive at him getting the job, but how did you arrive? For, for me, that, that's the kind of core of the novel. It's, it's revolving around that, uh, or at least my experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, I thought it, it was brilliant. And it's brilliant. You placed it in the, in the nine, you know, in 1959, yeah. 60. Yeah. What's amazing? Yeah. It's not different at all. It's, exa oh. it's exactly oh. the same, okay. right? Um, I don't think that's my experience, yeah. right? And yeah. so maybe, maybe as, as Julia just said, yeah. Ben Sion is right. Yeah. It's yeah. circular. Yeah. It's just, we keep on experiencing the same horror over and over again. Yeah, I, I've never done a job. Think I'm, I've never done a, the, you know, the, that kind of interview. But what I was really thinking about, I, mean, I have a lot of friends who've done those things, right? And it's just, you know, and it's, it's like the only time I've sat with like, a straight male friend of mine and helped him pick out clothes. It's just like, what the hell am I, like, what? You know? And, or like a guy called me at three o'clock in the morning, like, can I borrow a tie? And it's like, no, man, you know? And, um, but I have to say all of it came from, so I, I, I hear a lot of stuff about these interviews, you know? And especially people of my generation who go for interviews everywhere, don't get jobs, you know, just, it's tough. Um, but it's, but none of their complaints have anything, anything on book touring. Like, I'm sorry, but like, you know, I like when you're really touring for a book, you're doing like 150 dates a year, right? And you're doing it in, you know, if you're lucky, like eight foreign countries, you know? And so my life for a long time is like showing up at some like random European train station, having some weird person pick me up, like tell me about their weird life, like, Sometimes they're like crying and they're going through a breakup, you know, and you're listening. They like bring you to the hotel, you go to the hotel. It's like, you know, you sit there, you like watch, you know, BBC for 25 minutes. Then like you go somewhere, you know, and it's like, and, and, and in every country there's like a different rhythm and a different vibe. It's like the Germans will always take you on a German book tour. They'll always take you to an Italian restaurant because like that for them is like, you know, like they're really kind of getting messy, you know, gonna eat some Italian. It's a hot, spicy culture, you know, for the Germans. And, you know, where they're like, they'll like walk you through like the most basic, you know, I read German, I speak German, you go through the most basic like pasta menu, which is just international Italian. And they'll just explain to you that that's a mushroom and you're like, thanks man, you know? Um, but, but it's like, you know, it's, that, it's, I, it's just that these patterns that happen, you know, where, where, um, where you're in these places and you are a guest and you feel what being a guest is, you feel what being a host is, you feel, you know, all of these things. And then what, what's amazing is also the, um, it's the contrast, right? Because in these, in these moments, and I'm sure, you know, you go and you talk about the research that you've done. I talk about my book. You know, you talk about things that really matter to you, right? But it all really comes down to like, is breakfast included? You, you know? And, and, it's, and it's, that, it's that, you know, contrast, right, between, between that, that high and low that I felt really, um, I think, was, I was interested in. I also think really epitomizes, like, the intellectual's place, you know, especially in America. Oh. Hello. You're talking about Harold Bloom, and I want to talk to you about Harold Bloom because I like Harold Bloom because he's basically just describing like ego death for the sake of the ego, which is like fucking insane. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of questions that are far more boring than the one I'm going to ask you because okay. Bloom talks about how this question is actually very interesting, especially for other to, to know about other writers. Yeah. What's your anxiety of influence? Um. I think it changes a lot. I think my real anxiety of influence with this book was, was Roth. I think there was this idea that I could live for 300 years, like if I'm lucky, and I'm on my deathbed, and the last thing I'll hear is, oh, your writing reminds me of Roth. Like just like the last line that I ever hear from anybody before I die. And, um, and, um, and the funny thing is, is that I feel like it's an anxiety of influence, and maybe this is, you know, uh, Maybe this is a phenomenon that, that Bloom describes, though I don't know that I remember from the book, but it's, it's like I feel like it's one that was forced on me because I'm actually much more of a bellow person if we have to choose from that cohort, you know? Um, I, and I also have never written about myself. I'm not 
so interesting to myself. I'm not interested in myself. I don't, you know, there's that huge part of Roth that's just, you know, about this fictional stand in. I, I just, that to me is not, it's not a mode that I've written in or, or I feel like I, it would be pretty boring. Um, but, but yet it's just been this thing thrown at me and thrown at me and thrown at me and it's lazy and Jews and New Jersey and all of this shit. And, um, and so I was thinking, and then when, when I found out actually by digging around, because Harold didn't remember anything, that, um, that this thing happened in 1960. And um, so I could begin it in 1959, which is the year that Goodbye Columbus came out, won the National Book Award, um, like the kind of beginning of Roth's career. And I could do like a, a Roth type novel, right? Um, in, in some ways, you know, or at least dealing with certain of the tropes that he had to deal with, right? Um, but I could do it writing about some things that were never written about in the 50s. You know, I was talking about this earlier a little bit with students, but like one of the, the things that I think is very interesting is that, um, and very telling, is that, you know, with the exception of, uh, you know, Leon Uris's Exodus, right? There is not a book, I want to say with all respect to dead Leon Uris, there's not a serious literary book about Israel from the 1950s, um, a novel. Um, uh, there is not, frankly, a really serious book about the Shoah, about the Holocaust that shows up in English in, in the 50s. And I think we can even extrapolate, I mean, I, I'll even go farther than any of that and say that, you know, it's always, I always have to kind of remind myself, I don't know, I don't know why I need to remind myself, I, I just, I do remind myself that um, there are only about 10, 15 novels written um, about the death camps by survivors of the death camps, which is not a lot. Um, and, um, uh, very few of them, I think maybe one or two were written in English. So, you know, there seems to then be this deep um, repression or uh, an inability to talk about something, you know, or, you know, desire not to talk about it, something like that. Uh, and so part of the, you know, at the number of the day that anxiety say is, you know, let's write a Roth novel with some of the same kind of cliches and tropes or whatever, but let's have it be about actually events closer to the period that he chose not to write about and in fact didn't write about until you know the 80s you know um he didn't write about it until the 80s bellow didn't write about it until the late 70s you know until you get to to to, to samler um and so um so that to me was a was was sort of like okay maybe do something in that style you could be one of those guys but but talk about the thing that nobody was talking about at the time. Thank you. Um, I'm curious as to the degree to which you understand this to be historical fiction and the degree to which you understand it to be the historicity to be a constraint. And you talked about the, the title, the disclaimer at the beginning of movie or right. disclaimer at the end. How does the title function as a disclaimer or not to the historicity? And do you see the historical, fi how, how would you read the historical fiction in relationship to the models of historicism that you understand to be sort of thematic points in the, the medieval circularity versus the, yeah. um, the tax law version <laughs> of history? <laughs> well, I just, you know, the title, I can do the title first. The title is, you know, the title just sounded good. And it sounded, you know, right. I, I knew a guy who um, was very stupid that he did. It was pretty funny. Like during the protests outside of, um, you know, Balfour, Netanyahu's house um, that had been going on for a long time. Um, a guy I know um, made, he spent way too much money um, making up T-shirts that said um, the Netanyahu's 
in the Sopranos font, <laughs> which were like very cool t-shirts, but I guess it's illegal to do that. And like someone saw that on some press photograph and then of course they found his online store where he's selling it and like HBO shuts him down. Um, so it's kind of like a tribute to, I, I have one of those t-shirts. I guess they can't sue me for wearing it, but it was kind of like, okay, that's a good idea, you know? Um, uh, in terms of, I don't, I don't know anything about historical novels. I really, I mean, it's so stupidly, like, I, I was doing the two dumbest things I could think of, which is write a campus novel and write a historical novel. These are two genres I don't really know anything about. I, I mean, mean, it's the point of, like, real stuff that I do. Like, I, like, I fought Will Paul. Just have a bunch of probably read a historical novel, okay? Yeah. Or any, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Perfect, like, you know, but I was, but I, I, I mean, I know what you mean. You know, I know a bunch of, you know, um, Oh God! What was that that line I I, I loved? Was it um? The thing that told me this was that it was like an Isaac Bannon singer, right? Was talking about um, David Raj, and he said, "Sounds like every kind of remote previous writers." <laughs> so you know, I I don't know. Like I I I actually really know a lot about two of them Uh and I don't, and I felt constrained only <laughs> to do old threads, right? And to get the years correct, uh, I thought I could probably, you know, I, I'm sure if the years didn't work out for a fair block, I wanted you, I, I was done. But, um, but I don't feel constrained, um, mostly because I think most history is probably wrong. I don't know. Like the, the one, the two things in it, you know, uh, Pampers really, really were invented. Uh, uh, that year before, but I don't know that they would have had disposable diapers in that house. But then someone, you know, was telling me that, you know, you can't have a six-year-old wearing diapers. And then, uh, which was funny because I found out, this was from my father, that um, they would, when diapers were, they would just put kids of any age in diapers for long uh, car rides and just like let them piss in the diaper, like just for, you know? And I was like, wow, okay, that's cool. Um, but, uh, uh, but like little details like that, I don't think they ever, you know, I, I tried to get them right, but I didn't really sweat them. I, I, and I think part of that is just knowing that I, I, I don't believe it's possible, and I also don't believe it's desirable, right, I don't know in that order, um, to project myself into the head of someone who lived in another time. I just don't, I just don't think that, um, the imagination works like that. I don't think the imagination can transpose like that. And so as long as there isn't that, as long as we can't recreate a brain of that period, then everything's fake. And so as long as everything's fake, then like, you know, then you can do whatever you want. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, the general sense of uh, historic time. Um... And, and what are our models of history in, 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 in the book? I, you know, I, I, one of the dismaying things is that you know, um, I tend to I tended to always kind of come back to that that great line from from the Big Lebowski when it comes to Benzio Netanyahu, right? Where he says, you know, you're not wrong, you're just an asshole. <laughs> and I think that's a you know in, in, in Benzio Netanyahu, that's a, a sort of an apt description. You know, uh, I, unfortunately, I feel like his some of his descriptions of you know the circularity of history. It, you know, he's not speaking about it in a Spenglerian way. He doesn't believe that there are these like truly abstract patterns of like, you know, of ages of invention and so on and so forth. He, what he really believes is that, you know, that groups get into the same problems time and again. And, um, and that, uh, 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 and I, I, I think it's sort of impossible to look at, you know, the recent past and not, not think that. Um, I also though, understand that believing in that there's a difference in a history that is understood in history that's believed in. And I think that what's interesting is that Benzino Netanyahu really had to believe in his history and he had to kind of impose it on people. But now that's the history I sort of take as factually accurate and I feel like I need to believe in the progressivist history. You know, I don't think the progressive history is right, but I'd love to believe in it. And so it's, it's interesting that, you know, that 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 what history you 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 would like to believe in, what history you recognize as as, as descriptive of what you've experienced. Um, the other thing too is is that is that the 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 thing that I thought was was kind of interesting about the 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 history side of things 
was um, was that because I'm dumb and I don't I just don't know you know I just don't spend a lot of time in it you know a historian friend kind of took me out and was just like you know you're kind of your idea of a historian is someone who like writes a lot of pretty things like writes sentences and you know he's like that's a certain kind of history and you know whatever whatever and um, and truthfully I I kind of can't. And this is a real flaw. I can't conceive of history as anything beyond a rhetorical argument, and that's really just a limitation of mine. But I just I can't conceive it, you know, and not even in a very relativistic way, which is we understand that everyone's history is inflected by whatever, whatever. I just I can't even imagine presuming to write something as a fact without having an agenda behind it, because that's everything that I'm doing, right? I mean, every sentence that I'm trying to write, I'm trying to kind of put my finger on the scale one degree or another to kind of push something, even if it's just the coloration of something. And, and so the idea that there is some limpidity and some distance that can be had is just like, I don't know. I would, I would like to imagine that, you know. Maybe you can have one more question. Judy, yeah. Oh, I guess it um, it relates to what you were just saying. I was I was interested in the subtitle of the novel, an account of a minor and ultimately even negligible episode in the history of a very famous family. And what you were saying earlier about how sometimes you hear an anecdote and it could seem to kind of contain the whole world in it, or it could be a parable, or it could be productive of all kinds of meanings, and how like. Um, I guess the only sort of expectation of an anecdote is that it should be interesting. Mm. Whereas somehow a story, it's, well, like you just said, you're trying to kind of, like when you were talking about the opposition between like assimilation and, mm. you know, this desire to set oneself apart, like you're trying to sort of theorize or push, you know, you're mm. sort of at, it's an inquiry. And, but that theorizing is also kind of like you were saying, emotional and psychological. And so mm. I was wondering what, if there were, what moments or, you know, sort of aspects of the novel sort of resisted, like in, to the extent that the unconscious is also sort of operative, like resisted mm. or surprised you when you were writing it, like, oh, this isn't going the way I would have initially anticipated or, yeah. Yeah, I think it's always, you know, it's, it's like, I mean, it's called the unconscious because you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you know, like but there's yeah. just so many things to worry about that, like that, that, that it's, it's, you know, that I don't w worry about it to the degree that I think I'm able to convince myself that I intended everything. You know, and I think I, I need that degree of of delusion, you know, in, like to operate. You know, I think one of the, you know, one of the the things that becomes very dangerous. I mean, this is, comes along with a lot of like. You know, I know people who do, you know, like data and literary studies and, you know, where they, you know, they can tell you what year adverbs started being used more heavily and, you know, and they comb through everyone's work to find out, you know, what is it? The guy who went through like all of Nabokov and how many toes are described as long toes, you know, it's just so many long toes and all of his work, you know, and the, the idea that like, you know, that some data is going to show you, you know, you're unconscious or something like that. And. And I think, you know, that might be true for toes and for words and, you know, things like that. But, but I think that, that the real processes that, that work um, at, at a level that it is hard to detect until kind of much later are, are, are formal things. Because I think that, that um, you know, we don't really think in form. It's hard to think in literary form because literary form takes a long time to experience. Like you read a book, it takes this, you know. And, and I don't, and, you know, keeping, people who say like they keep a whole book in their head, it's just no. You know, you keep a feeling of a book in your head or, you know, or an impression, a picture of a book in your head. And so I think the, the form thing is the thing that always surprises me because, you know, there are things that I, I when I have a picture of something in my head where there's a moment that's it's very quick and, you know, but then when you get into it, it's like it wants to be longer and it wants to be deeper and there are things that you think are yeah this is going to be really where i'm going to write you know like this one this is going to watch out and then you know it just kind of ends up being one sentence like very brief and i think that um and those things um surprise me 
because um, they what they usually tell me is that um, is is that uh, far more is being implied, right, than I expect. And so when I think about, I have to write a lot of things in this one section, it's me kind of forgetting how much is implied elsewhere. And when I think I can do something very briefly, it's thinking that someone has direct access to the way this represents something to me. And it turns out, no, I need to unpack it and invite someone in. So yeah, formally, it's, I think it's, it, it, that, that, that's kind of where that happens. The subtitle was just me being an absolute asshole. Because, because the publisher was just like, people are going to think it's a nonfiction book. You need a subtitle. And I'm like, novels with subtitles are just stupid. Like, where, like, one is like, and then, so, like, it was the Netanyahu's colon a novel. For, like, I, for, like, and I was just like, this can't be. And they were just like, it needs to have a subtitle. Like, and, and I think, like, there was some, like, Amazon rep that was talking. It's all these, you know, they were just like, we're going to, it's going to be at our nonfiction warehouse or whatever. And it's just like, okay. And, uh, and so I just needed to come up with something. And I was so angry at them at that point that I decided to just give them the longest subtitle I could think of. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm just going to make up like an 18th century subtitle or whatever. And it's just going to go on forever. And I don't care. And, and, um, and I sent it in to them, uh, I think it, like really late at night, kind of like, as kind of like, fuck you, like, you know? And they were like, great. And it was, a, it was just done. They didn't say based on true story, parenthesis. <laughs> no, no, but but you know, but it, it's also like, and, and it's a, it's another story with lawyers. It's like when lawyers go to look at it, just like, it, it, it's the the idea of you know, lawyers is someone you you pay so you can have a problem, and it's just like, you know, and they all try to get you to read their novels afterwards. <laughs> Ridiculous. Wow. Thank you so much for today. Yes. <laughs>